Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Allison Hoons, and I'm an affiliate knowledge broker at Arthritis Research Canada, and I'm a member of Arthritis Research Canada's Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. And I'm thrilled to be your moderator for this afternoon's webinar and excited to listen to the presentations of our guest research scientists. This webinar is being presented as a part of episode number three of the Arthritis Research Education Series. This topic was selected based on an increasing level of interest and importance in learning more about hip pain and osteoarthritis, which unfortunately are increasingly common and can ultimately require a hip replacement. If you're joining us today for the first time, the Arthritis Research Education Series was created by Arthritis Canada, Research Canada's Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. The purpose of this series is to provide an in-depth look at specific areas of research and to share in an informal manner, important, new, relevant research with patients and the public. In addition, this is just a great opportunity to get together when physically distancing. Many of you have already viewed the videos for this episode on our website. And this afternoon, we're delighted to have our two featured researchers here in virtual in-person to give a short presentation on their work. After each presentation, there will be a short time set aside for your questions. So please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A icon on the lower right hand side of your screen. Following the, the presentations by um, our, our scientists today, we will bring both of them together for a Zoom panel question and answer period. So I'd like to introduce to you today's first presenter, Dr. Yasek Kopek. Dr. Kopek is a professor in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. And he's a senior scientist at Arthritis Research Canada. He earned his medical degree from the Pomeranian Medical University in Poland and his PhD from the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McGill University here in Canada. Dr. Kopek's main area of research are musculoskeletal epidemiology, that means bone, joint, epidemi uh, epidemiology, quality of life studies, and population health. A major focus of his arthritis research is the application of computer simulation modeling. So without further ado, over to Dr. Kopek. Thank you, Alison. Um... I am delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you today about my research. Uh, we had uh, several uh, research questions. We were interested to find out if physical activity is associated with hip pain, if FAI interacts with physical activity to cause hip pain, how common is FAI? And is it associated with activity limitations and reduced quality of life? Uh, so what is FAI? Um, Dr. Ratzlaff will um, provide more detailed explanation. I will uh, just briefly mention that it occurs when extra bone grows along the bones that form the hip joint, as shown here in this picture. Um, and this uh, may cause extra friction and what we call impingement, which over time can lead to damage in the joint and osteoarthritis. When we diagnose FAI, we look at x-rays, pain in the hip, usually in the groin, and impingement sign on physical examination. In this study, we took a random sample in Vancouver. Uh, we took x-rays of both hips, evaluated for impingement sign, and obtained uh, questionnaires for physical activity, pain, and quality of life. We studied 500 
uh, white people, 20 to 49 years of age, uh, a little more than a half of them had pain. Um, as you can see on this table, um, we had more women than men. Uh, the majority were in, in their 40s and had some college or university education. So we found um, that lifetime physical activity was a risk factor for hip pain. As you can see on this picture, those in the most active category here were almost three times as likely to develop hip pain as those in the least active category. In our study, occupational, domestic, and recreational activities were all associated with pain. We also found that some activities caused pain in people with and without FAI. And others, and especially domestic activities, caused pain only in people who had FAI, as shown, shown here. Um, but in people who were inactive, FAI alone was not associated with pain. Now, there are two types of X-ray changes typical for FAI. We call them CAM and PINCER. And Dr. Ratz Ratzlaff will explain in more detail the difference. Um, I will just say that uh, we found CAM in 35% of males and 7% of females. So there is a big difference in uh, how frequent these problems are in males and females. Pincer was less common, but also more frequent in men. Any form of FAI was present in 39% of males and 12% of females. Now, we were also interested in the correlation between uh, X-ray findings and symptoms. And we found this correlation to be weak. In other words, most people with, with changes on x-ray had no pain, and most people with hip pain had normal x-rays. A combination of x-ray changes, hip pain, and impingement sign uh, was found in 3% uh, of the population. And finally, when we measured the severity of FAI, uh, very precisely as so-called um, alpha angle here. Um, and we measured quality of life with a detailed questionnaire. We found that the more severe the changes on X-ray, the greater the limitations in activity and lower the quality of life as shown by this line here. So um, in summary, we showed that FAI interacts with physical activity in producing hip pain. We describe the frequency of FAI in the population, and we demonstrated the impact of FAI on activity and quality of life. Um, there are still a number of research questions uh, to be answered in future research. For example, we would like to know if uh, hip pain in young age is a predictor of of osteoarthritis later in life? What is the relationship of different types and levels of FAI with OA? Um, how FAI develops and can it be prevented? And how effective are various surgical and non-surgical treatments uh, for FAI in reducing hip pain and preventing hip OA? And that's all I have. Thank you very much and I'll be Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Kopak. That was a great summary of what I'm sure was a tremendous amount of work. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the question and answer uh, portion of our screen, but I have two personal questions. You, um, the Part of what the focus of this study was on something called correlation. And I know there can be some confusion about what, what's the difference between correlation and causation. So if there's a strong correlation, does that mean that we can say that something's caused by it? 
Um, maybe you could speak a little bit to correlation and causation for, for us to better understand um, what, this, what this implies, what the findings imply. Uh, this is an excellent question. And in this kind of research, which we call epidemiological or observational research, we um, generally do not say and cannot say that we observed uh, causation, that um, FAI, for example, is the cause of pain. We see that they coexist. There is uh, theoretical reasons to believe that there is a causal relationship, but we cannot observe this directly. So when we write a scientific paper, we always refer to association or correlation, uh, but we can only speculate that whether there is um, a causal association. To, uh, to prove causal association, we need to do intervention studies, which are uh, sometimes difficult because we cannot um, force people to have FAI or to behave in different ways. So, uh, those, so this is an important distinction. Thank you. That was really helpful. I once heard it explained to me that one could say that uh, um, you could wonder, just because you see uh, a fire truck at every fire, uh, they're strongly correlated, but it doesn't mean causation. <laughs> it's there, but the fire trucks don't cause it. So Precisely. thank you. Uh, on, another question um, that was the questionnaires um, and uh, what, um, what some of the limitations might be about questionnaires. Why, uh, when we look at findings from a questionnaire, are there any limitations associated with making conclusions from that? Certainly, uh, there are um, various limitations. Uh, questionnaires are very important in this kind of work because symptoms is a subjective phenomenon and we need questionnaires to measure symptoms. Quality of life is also subjective. So we cannot do this kind of research without using questionnaires. At the same time, there are always um, errors in measurement and questionnaire is a type of measurement. So uh, some uh, respondents or uh, participants in our studies may misinterpret uh, some of the questions. Some may uh, decide not to answer some of the questions. And uh, this um, has to be taken into account when analyzing the results and interpreting the results. Um, in, uh, in our case, we used a questionnaire to measure lifetime physical activity. There are various other ways to measure physical activity, but it's difficult to measure lifetime activity uh, in uh, ways other than the questionnaire. So uh, there are certainly um, potential errors, but uh, we can assess the reliability and validity of the questionnaires and in uh, and our questionnaires, all our questionnaires are thoroughly validated before we use them in um, uh, collect uh, our data. Thank you, Dr. Kopech. Those are, those are great answers to some questions which often cause some confusion, so much appreciated. Now I do notice that there are four questions in the Q&A box. Uh, however, those questions are very clinical in nature. Um, they are probably going to be answered uh, in all likelihood by Dr. Ratzlaff's presentation. Um, so I'm not going to ask you, Dr. Kopak, to address those questions because they're very clinical in nature. And um, with the permission of those who have put them in the text in the Q&A box, if they're not answered during Dr. Ratt's last presentation, then I will raise them as questions after his presentation. So thank you again, Dr. Kopak. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ratzlaff. Um, Dr. Ratzlaff, our second presenter, is a clinical epidemiologist and a fellowship-trained orthopedic physical therapist. 
His research has focused on identifying and validating early signs of damage on imaging, such as changes you would see on x-ray or on MRIs, biomarkers, and phenotypes. Phenotypes is kind of a fancy research term for subcategories or types of hip and knee osteoarthritis, and in developing prevention strategies. He's an expert in evaluation and treatment of hip, knee, and back pain in world-class athletes from professional and national teams in the general population. So the questions that we have in the chat box, uh, Dr. Ratzlaff, just so you know, have to do with things like, um, is, is physical activity contributing to FIA, like Dr. Kopak has said, um, what about sitting long-term? Uh, what about somebody who gets um, more activity, they, they get more hip pain? What happens if you get hip pain after walking a mile after a period of time? So they're very clinically related questions. Um, so we can get to those if they're not in your presentation, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, so now over to you, Dr. Ratzlaff, for your presentation. Okay, Allison, thank you very much for the kind introduction and words and Dr. Kopech for your presentation. I'm, I'm honored and delighted to be here to talk about one of my favorite topics. So thanks for inviting me. I'm gonna try and share my screen now. Can you see that, Allison? Okay. So I've subtitled my talk, Young People, Old Joints. And um, I think the whole area of femoroacetabular impingement, FAI, is a really exciting area. And um, it's truly one that we can start to talk for the first time, I think, about what's called primary prevention in osteoarthritis, which means preventing it from developing in the first place and secondary prevention, which means stopping it from progressing once the symptoms have started. Uh, it really is one of the biggest advances in hip OA in a long time. And what's exciting is that it can be detected early. Um, the average age at diagnosis is 37 uh, in some studies. And in my practice, I've seen people in their 20s and even adolescents that are showing the early signs of, of impingement in their hips that could cause uh, potentially osteoarthritis down the road. So a quick orientation to the joint um, and with different types of FAI. Um, this is the femur, that's where the F part comes from. Uh, this is the ball of the hip joint. This is the, the socket of the hip joint or the acetabulum, that's where the A comes from. And um, this little blue uh, rim around the socket is called the labrum, a specialized kind of cartilage. I'll talk about that in a moment because it's important in FAI. Now the first kind of, there's two kinds of bony FAI that Dr. Kopech talked about already. The first time, the first one affects the, the head of the femur. That's kind of this bump of bone here that you can see it shown in red that forms where the, the neck here, the femur and the head join together. And it really does take physical activity, physical motion to cause problems in FAI, like Dr. Kopich discovered in his research. Um, so when, when the hip joint is moved, uh, often it's moving the knee toward the, the chest, like in, like in sitting or, or in, in, in skating and hockey or in, in soccer or in lots of occupations where you're squatting. And that collision is early, happens early and it can damage things, uh, structures inside the hip joint. The second kind is called pincer, and it really refers to the other side of the joint, the socket, where there is some form of over coverage. The socket is too deep, or it's got some extra bone here, as indicated in this, in this uh, graphic here. And again, it takes the motion of the hip joint to become a problem. And <clears throat> we'll talk about the different structures in a moment. Another really important factor in FAI is what's been termed dynamic FAI. And even when there isn't bone changes that I've just talked about, and sometimes when there is, the muscles play a really big role in causing the impingement. 
And it's often because the muscles in the front of the joint, the hip flexors, for example, are tight or stronger than the muscles in the back of the joint. And the net result is it draws the, the head of the, the ball of the hip joint forward during movement. And some of those same changes of impingement can occur. And this is where rehabilitation can play a big role, whether or not you have changes on x-ray. So FAI itself, as Dr. Kopich said, isn't necessarily the problem when it shows up on x-ray. Um, when there's movement and early collision occurs, structures inside the hip joint can get damaged. Most commonly, those are this, the labrum, which is this rim of specialized cartilage that I talked about earlier, really important for stability, lubrication of the joint, and it, it'll tear like the illustration shows here, often right in the area where that bump is or the over coverage is. And also the cartilage can be damaged in that same area too. And this is, is the start, it can be the start of osteoarthritis and it can progress over the years to whole, whole joint involvement and uh, cause osteoarthritis, which is, which is exciting for us because it can be detected early and possibly prevented. This is uh, the same slide Dr. Kopech showed, and I wanted to illustrate it because his research beautifully um, showed what we find clinically. Um, and that is that the most important correlation is between symptoms the patient experiences um, and the physical signs that we find in the clinic. Um, and that's, they were correlated much more strongly than the weak correlation between x-rays and symptoms and x-rays and physical signs. And um, <clears throat> that was, that was con confirmatory of what we see uh, in the clinic. And it really takes this overlap of physical signs, symptoms, and an x-ray to be what's called clinical FAI. So what are the signs and symptoms? By far the most common one is groin pain right in the front of the hip. Um, second most common is lateral pain on the outside of the hip. And then a lot of other um, pain areas can develop because over time when your hip is limited, our bodies compensate, our backs can become more mobile, our knees can be affected. And some of these other changes are, are usually related to compensation because of the groin pain and limitation of movement. Clicking in the hip joint is present in about 70% of people with clinical FAI. And some specialized tests we do in the clinic are almost always positive and we can detect it in the clinic fairly early with these tests as well. One problem is that it takes usually about two years or more to diagnose FAI um, properly. And in that time, damage to the inside of the joint can occur and some of these compensations can also occur that hurt the low back and the knee, for example. So here's a couple examples of those, those specialized tests I was talking about. And these are things we do routinely when we examine the hip to look for the signs of FEI and impingement. Um, and then uh, after that, we look at, at the biomechanics of, of what's happening uh, inside the, uh, or sorry, what's happening during movement that could be contributing to it because physical activity is such an important part of the development of, of pain from FAI. This is an athlete, a pro soccer player that was just asked to do some simple squats. And you can see that his knee is turning in quite badly. His balance is off. There's a lot of early collision happening here that's increased by his, his knee turning in and, and also his pelvis rolling forward here because his core was weak, if you can believe it, in a pro soccer player. And then when we did a few moments here in a second, you'll see how much better it looked. That was with 10 minutes of instruction. And you can see how much more aligned he was and how much, how much probably better chance his hip joint had of moving properly, even in the presence of FAI. So how do you treat FAI? The two most common modalities are physio and surgery, and they've been compared recently in a couple of uh, randomized controlled trials, a type of experiment that Dr. Kopich was, was talking about earlier. Uh, one of those uh, has shown that, um, that physio was uh, as good as surgery. Another one showed that surgery was uh, superior. So there isn't really a clear cut answer to it, but it probably comes down to the individual patient and their situation. Um, both have been shown to be effective. As far as physio goes, there's some key things we work on. One is to optimize the hip motion. This is uh, me manipulating a hip joint. 
Other things that, that can be effective are, are dry needling or IMS or massage therapy or muscle release techniques. What doesn't work is trying to force the joint, like for example, bringing your knee to your chest and, and into the impinged position, that would just cause more problems. So even though you might want to try and get that range back, it's really important in FAI not to try to force it in that direction. Um, what can work actually is, is posture and alignment can really improve FAI, just like with that soccer player. Here you see a, another uh, patient that his pelvis is rolled forward here. And you can imagine that that socket is dropping down closer to the bump on the femur and he's in this position. With a little training and making his core a little stronger and training his movement and getting the pelvis more level, we can open up the front of the hip in the same movement he's doing uh, and cause less impingement, even in the presence of a bumper over coverage. And then we, we move on to strengthening the muscles. In this case, the, the so-called rotator cuff of the hip, these muscles at the back that I said earlier can get weak and allow the, the ball to be drawn forward can be strengthened. And actually we can bring the hip ball back in the socket, back toward the center where operates most effectively um, and reduce impingement. And then we train the pelvic posture and core like the previous slide with, uh, with, um, with our patients. This is, I'm showing some professional athletes, but it's equally applicable to occupations and activities of daily life. This guy was a pro hockey player working really hard to work on his core here. He had to hold off defensemen with his arms, so I'm resisting his arm here. But this is all in the purpose of trying to decrease that, that crowding and impingement in the front of the hip during skating, especially with him. And in this skier, he was rolling his knee in like that soccer player and getting hip pain. So um, in order to train um, our patients, we want to really reproduce their activities of daily living, their work life or their sporting life to, um, to try to decrease the impingement and symptoms. If physio doesn't work, then surgery is often the next step, and it's a specialized kind of surgery called hip arthroscopy, where the, the surgeons use a very minimally invasive technique to put their tools into the hip joint. And in this next slide here, you can see the labrum uh, I talked about earlier has been repaired with a suture in this case. In other cases, they will do uh, a specialized procedure called an osteoplasty, which means to trim this extra bump of bone down to make it more, uh, to make it more like the normal anatomy that doesn't cause impingement. So that's more than my time allotted. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity again to speak and, and uh, I'll be happy to, to answer any, try to answer any questions that, that arise uh, from this talk. Thank you, Dr. Ratzlaff. I know how challenging it is to uh, review anatomy, review, review pathology and treatment all in just a few minutes. So thank you for hitting the highlights there for us. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the questions that are uh, in our uh, chat box at the moment, in our Q&A box. Um, and the first one is, in addition to physical activity, contributing to FAI, which Dr. Kopeck's work had shown, how much does sitting contribute to it? You're on mute, Chuck, yeah. Okay, well, that was that was for me. So, yeah. so that is an excellent question. I know Dr. Kopech and I, we struggled at one point over the sitting question in some of our uh, studies, and I, maybe he can speak to that in a moment. I can't recall what we ended up deciding. I think it was difficult to measure. Um, but sitting uh, absolutely can play a role in, in the uh, symptoms of FAI. Um, most chairs put the hip in about 90 degrees of flexion, uh, which is the motion where you bring your knee toward your chest or more. If you think of sitting in a soft couch or chair, it's much more than that or a bucket seat in a car. Um, so it, it, in my clinical experience, this, the research hasn't been done yet, I don't, I don't believe on sitting. Uh, but in my clinical experience, sitting is absolutely an important um, uh, position to consider modifying if you're having symptoms and, and if you're going to want to prevent it to, to stay to chairs that keep the hip angle maybe less, a little bit less than 90 degrees. Okay. So um, sitting with a little less bend is what you're saying. Um, 
There's also a question then, and this uh, it came up in Dr. Kopak's uh, uh, presentation, but maybe you could um, uh, share a little bit more about that. If there is a correlation uh, between uh, activity and hip pain, should we not be being active then? Are you asking, sorry, asking Dr. Kopak? Yeah, no, asking you. Two questions for you, and then we'll go back and forth. Sorry, can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, if the, if the research has shown that there is a, a correlation between activity yeah. and hip pain, yes. does that mean that we shouldn't be being active? So that, that's a really important question, um, and thank you for asking it. Absolutely not. It, it, it means it, it's not... Uh, 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 you know, an indication or recipe to stay inactive. There are so many health benefits to being active. Um, and we want to maximize people's physical activities to the extent we, we can. It does mean that if you are having symptoms, that you may need to modify some activities so that you don't keep recreating that early collision in your hip joint. Um, some people have trouble with, with climbing upstairs, you know, again, where the hip is flexed a lot or they have problems with squatting down. So they may have to modify how they do those activities or choose different sports, sometimes cycling even because in a road bike, your hip has to go up to about 100, 105 degrees of flexion at the top of the pedal stroke. You may need to, to change to a mountain bike or change to a different form of exercise. So talking to a clinician about those types of things and what you can modify absolutely can help prevent progression once it's your hip motion is limited and you're having symptoms. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ratzlaff. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a, a, first of all, a really nice comment that you would both, uh, I'm sure, appreciate here. Thanks to both doctors who explained this subject so very well. I feel a great deal more informed. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for those kind comments. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, questions that are, are um, more personally related, where people are sharing about their individual circumstances. And I know that's difficult to answer without doing the physical examination. Um, so I hope uh, it's okay for those people who have posted those questions that I don't share those questions because often to answer um, personal questions, it requires um, an examination, and uh, we're not able to do that during a webinar. So some of those questions I'm going to unfortunately have to skip over. Uh, there is a question about um, uh, arthroscopic surgery. Is that generally for the younger individual? Yes. So their hip arthroscopy has really gone through an evolution in the last 15 years since the whole FAI term and its diagnosis and treatment has exploded. Uh, initially, there was a lot of excitement that this could be a real route to, to stopping away in its tracks. But what, what surgeons have found, um, and this is based, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, so I don't want to speak for them, but based on the literature and my experience with patients is that it's, it's been really um, honed in on uh, to the younger, younger people who don't already have, have early or moderate signs of hip osteoarthritis. Um, one surgeon I know won't operate on anybody over 40 um, for, with hip arthroscopy because his results were so poor that people ended up going on to total hip replacements anyways a few years later. So surgeons, in my experience, have become much more careful uh, and our, our evidence is coming in to help them make those decisions about who and who, who should and who shouldn't get um, the hip arthroscopy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kopek, is there something that you didn't have an opportunity to explain that you were hoping if there was a minute or two more that you could share? Hearing what some of the questions are, is there something that you wish that you could add to um, what you shared as key messages, having spent quite a lot of time looking in, in depth in this subject, is there something that you wished you had another minute to explain? Well, uh, probably um, uh, it might be interesting to um, try to explain sort of what, what are the practical implications of our research because, um, what we are trying to do usually is to um, 
to confirm a hypothesis, to advance knowledge. But the question might be, well, so um, how do I benefit from this, this research? Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, um, we, uh, for example, uh, provided data on the prevalence of FAI. How is how uh, it is important? Well, uh, understanding the burden of disease is important because it helps um, policymakers determining how important an issue is and uh, how resources should be allocated. So. Um, studies that may not seem to be directly relevant, in fact, have um, relevance to how care is provided. In the same way, when we talk about correlation between uh, FAI and pain and, and the, the fact that it's relatively weak, it means that uh, those two things can coexist. And the fact that someone has um, FAI on x-ray and at the same time as pain doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there is a direct causal association and um, there may be other causes of um, hip pain. For instance, uh, uh, um, bursitis, tendinitis, um, injury, soft tissue injury and so on. So it is important to rule out those other causes and uh, analyze the symptoms and uh, changes on x-ray perhaps use other methods to visualize the problem such as MRI before we can determine that um, treatment such as surgery would be beneficial. So we have to be very cautious about that. So That's I think an important point. Thank you, Dr. Kopak, because I'm sure we could all, as we sit here <laughs> with our hips flexed, watching this and hearing that activity also can increase. Sometimes we can get too worried um, that we might all have FAI. And your studies have shown that it's a very small percentage of people who actually do. And there can be other causes for the hip pain. So that takes it back to a question to Dr. Raxlav. People are asking, um, who should they go and see if they're having symptoms? Should they go see their GP, a physio, a rheumatologist? What would you recommend? Because this seems like a really specialized area. Um, thanks for that question. It's a great question. Um, FAI, FAI, you know, 15 years ago was just breaking, or actually 20 years ago was just breaking into the clinical terminology of subsports medicine specialists, essentially, um, and physiotherapists. Um, so uh, it's now become more widely known. We see it written about in rheumatology journals, lots in orthopedic journals, lots in physiotherapy journals. Um, so the people most likely to, to know about this are, are physiotherapists and physicians who are subspecialized in either orthopedics or in sports medicine. Um, so I would, GPs, not all GPs are yet aware of this, I don't think, but, but many are now. Um, but seek a, a referral to someone who has some specialty in the sports or orthopedic field, I would say would be your best bet. Right, so you could even phone um, and say, are, are, do you have a specialized knowledge in uh, different kinds of hip pain, for example? Exactly, I would, I would ask around um, if you can, and, and I know on the, the physio uh, website, I think it's the PABC website, or if you just Google find a physio, you can actually select specialties and look for people in your area who have specialized postgraduate training in sports medicine, sports rehabilitation, orthopedic rehabilitation, um, and then call that clinic and say, I've got FAI, you know, and if they, if they say, what's that, maybe hang up and try a different clinic, you know, um, but thank you. Yeah. So just to reiterate, Dr. Ratzlaff is saying online, if you Google Physiotherapy Association of BC, you'll come up with find a physio. And if you look under find a physio, you can select physiotherapists who have specialized training in orthopedics. 
And then you can phone the clinic that's nearest you and say, I want an assessment to see if I have FAI. And if they ask what that is, probably not the best location for you to go for that uh, assessment. Now I'm looking at the time and unfortunately there's lots of great questions in the Q&A. Um, Chuck, you had another? Yeah, just a, I, that's just the physio side. On the medical side, any sports medicine physician now will know about this. It gets, it gets a lot of attention at their conferences. For sure, orthopedic surgeons know all about this. So there's other specialties too, but those three are probably the most, uh, and rheumatologists has made, made their way into the rheumatology journals too. So any of those specialties, but as far as primary contact with the public, physio and sports medicine um, would, be, would be probably your first stops. I wanted to make one other, I know we're short for time, but Yasek raised a, a really important point. And he talked about some of the periarticular tissues, sort of as the, the tissues around the joint, like tendons and muscles, that, that can be causes of pain. It's really a big cause of pain in FAI. The muscles guard, the muscles go into spasm. So it's not always the collision, it's protecting to the collision from occurring that can be causing the pain. Those are all very treatable things that can be um, uh, addressed in, in, in rehabilitation. So. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, as I said, there are other questions that are in the Q&A box. Um, I'm wondering, uh, gentlemen, with your permission, is it okay if we copy and paste those uh, and ask you to address them at another time and we can post them on the website with, um, for this particular topic so people can have their questions answered? Sure. sure. Yes? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, I now uh, would like to thank everyone who has joined us today. We At one point, we had over 100 people that were participating. So that's fabulous. Obviously, this topic is of interest. And we hope that you all found this webinar informative, helpful, and even fun. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors because without their help, it's, it's hard to get the resources to do this. Uh, so the sponsors for today's episode were Merck Canada, Gilead Sciences Canada, Novartis, and Eli Lilly. Finally, we'd like to say a special thank you to our presenters, Dr. Yasek Kobach and Dr. Chuck Ratzlaff. We're grateful to have the opportunity that you could share your uh, knowledge um, and your research on this very important topic. For those of you who are participating in real time or reviewing a, um, a record, the recording of this webinar, um, please take the opportunity to visit the website for the Arthritis Research Education Series page. I encourage you to do so because there's lots of great information on this topic and all the wonderful research that's undertaken by um, the scientists at Arthritis Research Canada. Soon after this webinar ends, we'll be sending out a quick survey and hope that you can find just a few minutes to provide your feedback. I know sometimes it's hard when you see a, a survey, um, but it, it is important because it informs what we can do for future sessions. So if you can tell us what works well um, or what we could do a little bit better, that would really help us. You can find us at Arthritis Research, all one word, arthritisresearch.ca. And uh, also know that the recording of this webinar will be able for viewing on uh, the web page probably within about a week's time. And we will send a link to you provided in a follow-up email. So thank you gentlemen for a most informative um, uh, session today and for your work um, because you're researching um, something that's important to a lot of people uh, to make our lives more comfortable. So thank you. It was a privilege, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity.